Okay, take your Bible and go to Galatians chapter 3. I want to uh, recommend Sunday schools uh, this coming Sunday, 10 o'clock. We are teaching on how to love God the Bible way, and we're teaching on how to love God with all your soul this Sunday. Amen. How, to the, how to love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. So that'll be this Sunday, so don't miss that. It'll be a definite help to you, and uh, hopefully the, the lessons about love, loving God are, are being a blessing to you, and you're able to love God more <clears throat> because of them. Okay, Galatians 3, we're going to read verses uh, 16 through 29. Let's all stand. I'll read them. Follow along with me as I read. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For the, if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. So the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, <clears throat> we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have, been, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the word of God. Thank you for the promises of God. And thank you for loving us and caring for us. And, and Lord, please help us not open our hearts to what you want to show us from your word. And Lord, speak to us, challenge us. If, you need, if there's an area that we each individually need to change in our lives, help us to see that clearly tonight and be willing to do that. Lord, if someone is here tonight and does not know Jesus as their Savior, help them to see that tonight they can have eternal life by putting their faith in your Son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> continue uh, through this chapter, <clears throat> and you'll see that this chapter has a, a lot, uh, shows you, talks a lot about the law, and talks a lot about faith. So we're going to we're gonna be talking about that tonight, <clears throat> and um, we'll see if we finish up the chapter or not. It doesn't make any difference. I figured out, that I, I, I thought about how many, the, the rate that I'm teaching through a book of the Bible, all right, and since I've been here, I've taught the book of Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and now Galatians. If I kept going at the rate I'm going now, to get through the whole Bible, it would take me 99 years. How many think I can do it? I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> but that's what it would take. Isn't that amazing? But, so, but again, we're not in any hurry uh, to get through the Bible. We just want to get, I want to just show you the things that I've learned from it, and hopefully they'll be a blessing to help you with your Christian life. And now verse 16 <clears throat> says, Now to Abraham, and his seed, where the promise is made, he saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one into thy seed, which is Christ. That reminds me of the verse, and I think it's referring to Christ being the seed, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God was talking uh, to uh, <clears throat> Satan, and he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is a... Uh, a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, the one that would, would defeat Satan uh, by dying for our sins and paying our penalty. Of course, that's Jesus Christ. And so uh, through Christ came all the promises. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. All right, so all, all the promises come through Christ. Now that doesn't matter what promise you're talking about. We don't, we, if you think about it, we can't get any of the promises to us uh, if we don't accept Christ. I mean, that's that's... None of the great promises that God made, and there's a lot of amazing promises in the Bible, uh, could not be possible for us if we did not come to Christ first. And if Christ did not come here to earth and pay for our sins, it wouldn't make, make, make any difference. Um, but through Christ come all the promises. And Paul says here, and this I say, verse 17, that the covenant, that the covenant means a contract or a testament or an agreement that was confirmed 
before of God in Christ, the law which was 400 years and 30, uh, 430 years after cannot disannul. That it should be, should make the promise of none effect. So he's saying here that the law cannot disannul. The word disannul means to invalidate or to cancel out. The law cannot affect what God is doing in a negative way. Okay, the law cannot affect that. If God promises something, God makes an agreement about something. He's going to keep his promise. And if he promises something, it's going to happen. For example, Jesus was promised. Way back in the Old Testament, Jesus was promised. And he came. All right, he came. He came just at the right time. In due time, God sent forth his son just at the time that God figured it was going to happen, just at the exact time God planned it to happen, but he was promised. And nothing, the law cannot, no matter what the law says, it cannot uh, invalidate whatever God promises. Cannot take away what God says. It cannot cancel out a covenant. It can't do that. Okay, the law, law is not capable of doing that. Now, we're going to find out what the law is for in just a little bit as we go through this. Now, verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. All right? <clears throat> it is no more of promise. But God gave, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. God gave the inheritance to Abraham by promise. Now, I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Let's talk about our inheritance. And God, and, and so, again, the law, the law has nothing to do with this. The inheritance is not by the law. Uh, if it was, it wouldn't be by a, be a be, it would be no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. And here's the inheritance that we are dealing with with ourselves. First Peter 1, 3, and 4. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Okay, that's our inheritance. Now, uh, the inheritance is just, it's an amazing thing. I don't know what it all involves. I don't know what, I don't know what it all means exactly. Okay, if you say, what well, describe the inheritance. I don't know. It's something God's going to give us because we're in his family. We're his children. And it's going to be great. Now, it's not based on keeping the law. We're not going to get it because we keep the law. All right? We're going to get it because we are in his family. That's why we're going to get our inheritance. We're going to get rewards because we obey God. But we're going to get our inheritance because we're in the family of God. All right? So that, so that inheritance is for everybody. Uh, it, it's an amazing thing. I, it's, I think it's incredible. I, I'm just amazed. I'm overwhelmed by the fact that God would save me, but then the fact that he would add stuff to my salvation, uh, give me other things besides eternal life, that's incredible. The fact that he would give me an inheritance, the fact that he would then offer me rewards if I live for him and do his will, that's incredible. I mean, plus he offers me the environment of heaven itself, the incredible environment where there isn't going to be any bad stuff, according to Revelation chapter 21. So really, we got a lot to look forward to, folks. That's why we should not, uh, death should not, scare us, death should not bother us, okay, because we got a lot of stuff coming to us that's absolutely amazing, so, the, but the law doesn't have anything to do with us getting this stuff, so then verse 19, the question is asked, wherefore then serveth the law, what is the purpose of the law, all right, what is the purpose of the law, it was added because of transgressions to the seed, that's Jesus, should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator or a go-between. Now, I want you to, to I want to look at some verses here. Uh, in, ver, in go to Romans three twenty. What, so, what is the purpose of the law? Uh, what what serveth the law? <clears throat> if it doesn't help us get stuff from God, uh, what uh, inheritance? If it doesn't get us eternal life, which it doesn't do that e either one of those things. What is what was the purpose of it? Romans three twenty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See that? That's the purpose of the law, to give you the knowledge of sin. Go over to a couple chapters later, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. <clears throat> Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Uh, this is saying to me that the law shows us, one of the things the law does for us is it shows us of what we're doing wrong, it shows us the seriousness of what we're doing wrong and how many things we do wrong. 
Okay? I mean, if you take, for instance, if you take a look at the Ten Commandments, if you go over the Ten Commandments, um, we're guilty. Uh, some, some are guilty of all of them. Most of us are guilty of most of them. Right. See, we're not just, okay, that's all we're saying. Only a sinner saved by grace. I'm not just this little tiny incy beansy sinner. Yeah, I've done a few things wrong. No, I've done a whole lot. Uh, and the law showed me that. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, go to that one. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So, I covet something, I really want something. What is that? That's lust. All right? So the law shows me that I, I'm, I have lust in my heart. Whether I covet my neighbor's wife, whether I covet my neighbor's goods, it doesn't matter. I have, I have, if I'm coveting, I'm lusting. I have a strong desire. And I really want it bad. Okay? And the law showed me that. The law showed me that. Now, so the law definitely has a purpose. I'm going to get more to that more as we go on here. Now, so God gave the law through Moses. It had, it had its purpose to show us our sin. Then Jesus came to fulfill the law and pay for our sins, pay for the, for the th times that we have broken the law. All right, now, verse 20, now a mediator, a go-between is, is not a mediator of one, but God is one. All right, so Moses was a mediator. Uh, uh, he went between God and all the people. He, he was the messenger. He, brought, he was a mediator. God, he went up and got the law from God and the Ten Commandments and brought it down to man and showed us showed us the law. And, of course, he wrote, uh, I was going to say he wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Wow. He wrote uh, Gen Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, where the law is found. And so, uh, so, but God gave it to us. And, again, it wasn't to give us a way of earning our way to heaven. Okay? If that's impossible. Now, go to verse 21 of, of uh, Galatians chapter 5. Is the law then against the promises of God? No, the law is a good thing. The law is not a bad thing. The law is not against the promises of God. Like, is the law against? Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. If you call on the Lord, you'll be saved. Uh, no, the law is not against that. God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given ver uh, life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. And then Jesus would not have died. Okay, so the law is not against what is not fighting against what God's all about. The law is a good thing; it really is. If there was a way uh, that law that uh, the law keeping law could have gave us righteousness, so that Jesus would not have to die, well, then life would have came from that, and then that would have made it so that Jesus didn't have to go through all he had to go through. Verse twenty-two. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Okay, the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. I love this verse. For I don't like the first part, but I sure like the second part. Now let's look at that. The scripture hath concluded, has shown us, that all under are under sin. Now that phrase, all under sin, means sin can bury you. Okay, it can bury you. Now, go to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Now, I know I'm saved. I, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. But I cannot lose sight of the fact that I'm a sinner. Okay? Romans 3.10. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. See that? There is none righteous, no, not one. The law hath concluded, <coughs> the scripture hath concluded, rather, that all are under sin. All. Everyone. Go to verse number 19. Now, we know that what sort of things the law saith, it saith them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty <clears throat> before God. <coughs> all the world, that includes me. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes me. So I, I cannot lose sight of the fact that I am a sinner just because I'm saved, just because I tell people about uh, salvation and, and approach an unsaved sinner and try to tell them about salvation, that doesn't mean that, I, that I, I'm not a sinner anymore. It's just one sinner approaching another, another sinner about the fact they need salvation. Now, it's a saved sinner approaching an unsaved sinner about salvation, but I cannot lose sight of the fact that I was at one time completely under sin. Sin was burying me. <clears throat> and without Jesus Christ, I would have been, I'm a, I would have been straight, headed straight to hell. 
that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Again, Romans 10, 13, <coughs> whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Go to John 6, 47. I love this verse. So the law is going to, and we're going to get to that in verse number uh, in the next couple of verses here about the law and faith, but it is our belief, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ was given to us that believe. John 6, 47. So what's the promise of faith? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's the promise of faith. Okay? The promise by faith of Jesus Christ. What promise do I get by putting my faith in Jesus Christ? I'm saved. I have eternal life. That's the promise. Look at it. Notice what it says. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. How long does everlasting life last? Everlasting. Okay? You cannot lose it. It's impossible. It's everlasting. When you call on Jesus and get saved, you are saved forever. All right, it is proper to tell someone you're saved forever. It is proper to tell someone, uh, uh, once saved, always saved. It's proper to say you can never lose your salvation because you can't. It's impossible. You have everlasting life. You have eternal life. All right, it, whether we're talking about eternal or everlasting, it means you're going to live forever. All right, you cannot lose your salvation. And it comes but that's the promise. That's the promise by faith. That's the one I get. Okay, and it's by faith of Jesus Christ. All right? Now again, when it comes to the promise of eternal life, you're not seeing anything about the law in there. Okay. Now, the law does play a part in our salvation, which I'm going to show you in just a second, but it has nothing to do with us with us getting saved. It, it has something to do with us seeing that we need to get saved. Now, go to verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed or disclosed. Before our salvation, by faith, the law was over us. Okay? Now, here's what it did. Here's what the law did, verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified or made innocent by faith. The law was our schoolmaster. The word schoolmaster in verse 24 means instructor. All right, now here's what the law did. It showed us we were sinners, that we couldn't keep the law, and we needed a Savior that we could only get by faith. All right? We could not do anything. We could not keep the law. The law makes it very clear. Again, all you got to do... Take, take the law, any laws of God. <clears throat> I'm not talking about moral laws. We're not talking about the ceremonial laws. We're talking about the moral laws, like the Ten Commandments, other laws in the Bible that God gives. Just go through them. Make, put, make a list. On one side, say laws that I, have, that I have broken and laws that I haven't broken. Okay? Now, you go through the list of laws. I guarantee you this law that you have, the side where it says laws I have not broken, there won't be very many things written on here. Okay, and that's what the law is. It's a schoolmaster. It's our, our instructor. It shows us that we are helpless and hopeless. See, okay, so we broke all these laws. Um, <clears throat> what's going to have to be done to take care of that? How am I going to take care of that? I cannot, there's no one in the Bible that says, okay, well, if you do one thing wrong, if you sin, and then you do one thing right, well, that one thing right cancels out the thing you did wrong. It doesn't say that in the Bible anywhere. It just says the law make, shows you that you are a sinner and the wages of sin is death. That's what it is. That's the payment you owe God. That's the only payment God will accept for your sin is death. And it's the law that's shown you that. All right? That's what, it, that's what it means to an unsaved person. It shows us we need a Savior because we cannot keep the law. In fact, we have broken the law several times, and we'll find out that the harder we try, the worse it's going to get. Verse 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Okay, so once you put your faith in Christ, so I, I, see, in, I see in the Bible, now for instance, uh, <clears throat> I, I use, when, I, when I'm soul winning, I use Revelation 21.8, so go there, I'll show you this verse real quick. So I'm talking to someone, and I'm, I'm using the Word of God to show them, I'm using the law of God to show them that they are sinners. Right? And it says here in Revelation 21.8, uh, 
Uh, but the fearful and unbelieving, uh, for instance, I will say, you know, it says here, I'll have sinned, right? So every, God says everybody's a sinner. Now, then I identify some of their sins, like I'll, I'll go through this list of Revelation 21 and 8, and, I, and of course I focus in on the liars. Now, th you know, I've gotten pretty bold in my old age. If I am, if I'm in a house where I suspect they might be using drugs, I go to that word sorcerer, which means, comes from the Greek word pharmakia, which comes from our word pharmacy, which our word pharmacy comes from. It's all about drug dealers, drug users. Okay, so I will t I will tell them now. Tell them that's what it means. All right? If I if they are living uh, if they are living in fornication or adultery, um, <clears throat> I might I might say something about what or show them that sin. I may do that just in a you know in a nice easy way and all. But what I'm doing is, but I especially focus on the liars. Because not everybody is guilty of sorcery. Not everybody's guilty of, of, of uh, murder. Uh, not everybody's guilty of fornication. But some people are guilty of, everybody's guilty of lying. Everybody's told a lie. And, and one of the Ten Commandments is you're not supposed to bear false witness against your neighbor. So therefore they broke the law. And even James says if you broke one law, you're guilty of all of them. So therefore, they, obviously the law is showing, I'm taking the law, using the law to show them they are a sinner and there is no hope. Because the wages of sin is death. And where do the people who tell lies go? They shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So I showed them their helpless situation, and it was a law that pointed out that out to them. And that's why God gave the, uh, the unsaved people have the law of God for that reason. Okay, for that reason. It's a schoolmaster. But once they put their faith in Jesus Christ, now we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're no longer under the law. Uh, uh, it's not our instructor anymore. We don't need the law to instruct us that we need a Savior anymore. We don't need that. But now the law is a standard to live by. Okay, now it's an opportunity for us to show that we love God. Go to John 14, 15. John 14, 15. Before I get saved, the law shows me that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I cannot save myself. It's hopeless. I've just broken so many of the laws, and I'm probably going to break some more uh, because that's the, I'm human and I'm going to sin. I'm a sinner. Can't, that's something that, that just I can't help it. All right. So then I so it shows me I need to be saved. I get saved. I put my faith in Christ. Faith has now come. I'm no longer under a schoolmaster. So do I just throw out the law? Does that mean I can throw out the Ten Commandments? That means I can throw out any, anything that God tells uh, talks about how I'm supposed to live? No. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. We are not legalists when we preach holy living. Okay, we are, we are legalists if we preach holy living, that you need to live holy to get saved. That's legalism. Okay, but it's not legalism to say you gotta keep, you're supposed to keep God's commandments if you're going to be right with God. If, you, if you're going to love God, you've got to keep his commandments. See, now most people, a lot of the Christians today, you'd be surprised. You make that statement in a lot of churches today, they would be really upset with you. But that's what the Bible says right there. That's what Jesus said. Hey, you know what? I have one of those, those red words, you know, where Jesus' words are in red. Uh, but, and, and Jesus said this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now the law, I, I don't throw the law out. I don't throw the Ten Commandments out the window. I don't throw the commandments of God out the window. No, I embrace them now as a way to show my Father that I love him. Amen. Show my Savior I love him. Show the Holy Spirit that I love him. That's what it's for now. So along with a schoolmaster, it's now a, a, a measuring stick that I can use or a way I can use uh, to show the Lord that I love him because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So now the law is real special to me. Now, I'm thankful for the law because it showed me I needed a Savior. It really did. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm also thankful now I have it as a way of showing God that I love him by keeping his commandments. All right, then look at verse number, Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 26. That for you all the children of God... By faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, now. <clears throat> You're a child of God when you put your faith in Christ Jesus. 
one of the false teachings going around in the religious world is that we are all children of God. If you're born, if you're a human being, you're breathing God's air, you are a child of God. That is so false. And this verse is one of the verses that makes it false. Okay, we either believe the word of God or we believe the, the, the uh, lovey-dovey type stuff that this world is trying to teach, that we're all children of God. No, we're not. I, don't become, I was not a child of God. Now, I was a creation of God, but I was not a child of God <coughs> until I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And then I became his child. Now, but I want you to see something. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. 1 John 3, 10. It says here, In this the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth, not his brother. So in this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. All right. If you don't do right, then you're revealed as a child of the devil. Now here's here's what here's the thing. When you get saved, okay. Now again, the, 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 you have it's going to a lot of stuff here when you're talking about this. But bottom line is true salvation. When you become a child of God, when you are born into His family, there's going to be a change. A major change is going to happen in your heart. A major change. All right, we're not talking about, I just got religion. No. If you just get, a person just gets religion, there's a little tiny change in their life. It's not, it's not a God, God-made change. So it is really it isn't re super real, and it's not really going to last. <clears throat> just like when I got saved, you know what my family said to me? Oh, you'll get over it. Because, you know, I, I started doing some crazy things. I started going to church. Three times a week. I'd spend more than an hour on Sunday morning. I'd spend Sunday school hour and church hour. So I was gone like two and a half, three hours. Then go back on Sunday night, and then go back on Wednesday night. I mean, I was asked by my family, what do you do that for? Why? See? And then, and then they saw me. They realized that I was, I was changing. There was a change going on in my life. Well, you'll get over it. Yeah, if I had just gotten religion, I would have been over it by now. See? But I didn't get religion. I was born to God's family. I now have a new family. I have a new father. I, you know, if before you get saved, you're you're a, you're a child of the devil, and you have you have you have a fa the father who's a de who's a, is the devil. And of course, when you get saved, you have now you have a new father. You better there is a change there. God the Father is different than the devil. You're in a different family now. See, you got a different book to guide you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you to guide you, so you're going to be different. Now, so there is going to be a change inside of you. Now, if you do, if you do what, the, what the change inside of you is leading you to do, what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do, then that change is going to come out of the outside too. It's going to show in a lot of ways how you treat people, on your countenance, right? It's going to show in a lot of different ways. All right, but if you if you are if you are don't have a change and you don't ever have a desire to do right and you don't do right, then there's a that, that, that is an evidence there that you are not a child of God. You are a child of the devil. Still, so please don't think just because you prayed bow your head and prayed a prayer. No, it has to be. You have to believe it from your heart. You have to understand what the gospel is, and you have to believe it from your heart. There has to be, a, you, ha, you have to, listen, you have to understand that, that why, why did Jesus come? Jesus came because you were headed for hell. You understand that? That's why he came. If you weren't headed for hell, why would he come and go through all he went through and pay for your sins? You were headed for hell. You were, well, your sins were taking you straight to hell. You, were, you lived your life day by day, one heartbeat, from hell. That's it. See, that, that's what it was. And you have to understand that. And so you have to understand that somehow in the, in the gospel presentation that you received from somebody, it had, to be made, it had to be told you, and you had to understand that, you know what, I'm a sinner, and I'm headed for hell. And I need to be saved. Listen, if, 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 you, if Jesus, if you, somebody says, well, you just need to ask Jesus to save you. Okay, well, then I, the question would go, to save you from what? He's not going to save you from your problems because you still have problems. He's not going to save you from your sins because you still sin after you're saved. 
No, in the Bible it says a person that gets born again gets sinless perfection until they get to heaven. So what's he going to save you from? He's going to save you from the penalty of your sin. See, that's why he came here. All right? And so, so he had to pay the price that you had to pay. And you had to pay death. That's what God said you had to pay. And it wasn't a physical death in the grave that you had to pay. It was a second death in hell that you had to pay. That's what you owed God when you broke his law. And I don't, I'm, I'm talking about me too. Same thing. I'm applying this to me too, of course. Uh, so Jesus came to pay that penalty. He died your second death. All right? And so you must realize that's what he's the Savior from. Right now, we, we, I like this. I like. The, I've said this many times. I like this outline. He, he came to save you from the penalty of your sin. So then you you see that you ask Jesus to save you. So now you're saved. So as you grow as a Christian, He's saving you from the power of your sin, the hold that sin had on you. You are starting. Let me put it this way: You are starting to, as you grow as a Christian, you you are starting to sin less than you used to. You are getting victory over stuff. And then, finally, he's going to save you from the presence of your sin. That's when you die and he takes you to heaven, or the rapture comes and he takes you to heaven. See? So, so it was all by faith. All right? It was all by faith. And we are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. All right? We are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the way he worded it. So, it's really important to see uh, that, that, that that's what makes us a child of God. Now, again... Uh, I think there's a lot of false professors out there, false people, people who say they're saved that aren't. But uh, I'm just telling you that I'm not saying that, okay, there are people maybe that because of different circumstances in their life, maybe they've got, I, I could see this happening. I could see, so, I could see a wife. I could see a wife getting saved, and her husband fi finds out about it, and he starts, to, he starts beating her physically, and he starts uh, threatening her, tells her she can't go to church, and so she, so she's, she. Uh, if you go to church, I'll kill you. And so, because she's a baby Christian and not, you know, she's not really super strong. Uh, she's just a baby. She gets a little scared, okay. And so she doesn't go to church because she's under a threat of physical punishment and even death from her husband. I could see, so I could see someone like that. You know, they don't show up for church. A lot of people say, "Well, uh, you, you had five people to the Lord. Where are they all?" You know what people usually say that are? The ones that never lead anybody to the Lord. They're the ones that usually say that. I don't know where they all are. I don't know, but God knows. And God knows who's for real and who isn't for real. God knows who meant it and who didn't mean it. I just did my job. I gave them the gospel. I explained to them clearly. They told me they understood. I asked if they'd like to be asked Jesus to save them. They said yes. So we bowed our heads and we prayed together, and I helped them to ask Jesus to save them. That's my job. I did my job. Now, whether they meant it, God knew, they knew, that's all it counts. Well, how come they didn't come to church that they really got saved? I just explained to you one of the reasons why maybe people don't go to church. Or maybe why they don't make a major change in their life. But I'll tell you what they have, definitely they cannot avoid is this burning desire in their heart that comes when you get saved. For a personal relationship with God. And to want to find out what God has for you, to want to learn more about God. That you get. I mean, you can't deny that. That happens. Okay? When you become a child of God. All right? So, I mean, just, okay, just like a newborn baby is attracted to mommy and daddy, so is a newborn babe in Christ attracted to their heavenly father. See? It's just, it's just a natural, a supernatural thing, really. But that's, that's what happens. So then, so verse 27 20, through 29, he closes out the chapter. He says, for as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, baptism is a picture, a bearing the likeness of his death, raised the likeness of his resurrection. So he's talking here about how that, that through, because they put on Christ, because they've been baptized into Christ, they now have put on him. And, okay, of course, when you put on Christ in your life, you are raised in the likeness of his resurrection. When you get baptized, you know, we say bearing the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And so when it's a way, it's, baptism is a way of showing the people I'm dying to my old self and I'm rising up to follow the Lord. Okay? I'm putting on Christ. I'm, I'm going to become like Christ. 
again, talking about the change that happens in their life. And then verse 28, 29, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all part of the same family. We have the same God, we have the same book. Okay, whether we're Jew or Greek, whether we're bond or free, that means enslaved or free, whether we're male or female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, we all get the we'll get all the promises made to all of God's children through the years. Okay, so <clears throat> we're heirs and we, we get the promise now of the of the inheritance. So let me just kind of go over real quick here, review this a little bit what we talked about tonight. Um, <clears throat> the um, the law and its curse will will not affect the agreement that God has made and the promises attached to it. When God makes a covenant. Like he said, he said, I'm going to send my son. The seed is going to come and bruise the, and bruise the devil or destroy the devil, defeat the devil. Uh, the law and his curse is not going to affect that. Okay, and, all, and the promise is attached to God's, to God's covenant, God's agreements. The law is not going to attach. So the law cannot affect what God's going to do in a negative way. Even though the law, you know, when, when it's first presented to a person, the law is a negative thing because, hey, oh, wow, that's the Ten Commandments. Man, I, I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. That's negative. But even though it's got its negative effects, especially when it's first introduced to a believer, or to an unbeliever, rather, uh, and they, they really see that, uh, even though that is, it has its, its curse and all that attached to it, it's not going to affect, it cannot disannul or, or affect or wipe out, cancel out what God has promised to do. All right? For instance, the inheritance. Okay, talking about the inheritance. I love talking about this. I don't know what, again, it's, it's, it's going to be a surprise, but it's going to be good. I want you to look over at Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Just talk a little bit about the inheritance here. The promises that we get, we get the promise of salvation through Jesus. We get the promise of the inheritance that we get through Jesus because we're part of his family and everything else that Jesus that comes along with our salvation. We get the promises of all that, and the law cannot affect that. When we put our faith, faith overcomes the curse of the law. Okay? Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified or set apart. Okay, and that is, that is sanctified, set apart. Those are, God, we are set apart from the world. We are, we are different. All right, we are in God's family. All right, and we have an inheritance. Acts 26, 18. <clears throat> okay, go to Acts 26, 18. Jesus is speaking here to Paul. And he says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that you may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Okay? So you got this inheritance here. You got Colossians 1.12, giving thanks unto the Father which made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And again, we talked about 1 Peter 1.4, the inheritance that's laid up, reserved in heaven for us. And so the law and its negative negativity cannot affect any of that. I'm going to get an inheritance. When I put my faith in Jesus, <clears throat> I'm going to get my inheritance. All right? Now, the law was given to show us that we were sinners. It was given to us by, by a mediator <clears throat> with the purpose of leading us to the Savior, the only one that could cure our sin problem. Okay, now, let me just say this about what a statement I just made there. I hope, if you're saved, you know he's the only one that can cure the sin problem. What's the main problem of sin? The penalty, taking you to hell. And he's the only one that can do that. Jesus Christ is the only one that can cure the sin problem. But let me just take it a little farther than that. One thing we sometimes forget. Even though you're saved, you're still going to struggle with things in your life. Sins in your life. And let me tell you, he's the only one that can cure that too. Okay? He is the cure to the sin problem. Whether we're talking about saving you from hell or whether we're talking about saving you from the power of your sin, he's the cure. Don't lose sight of that. Don't try to, 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 to uh, overcome this stuff by your own. I'm trying not to be angry. Well, that's good. You have an anger problem. You're trying not to be angry. But have you gone to the Lord and sought his help? And by the way, going to the Lord for an anger problem and seeking his help is not just saying, Lord, help me not be angry. That's right. No. Going to the Lord for an anger problem is praying that, definitely praying that, but also going to the Bible and finding out what his, he said in his word about anger. And writing down some verses about anger and memorizing those verses, hiding God's word in your heart, that you might not sin against Him. 
but he is the cure to that too. Don't just lay him aside when you get saved just to say, okay, now Jesus, you did what I asked you to do. And basically a lot of Christians say this. And I, I have a hard time believing that, I, I really, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I'm right on this. I'm just saying I have a hard time believing sometimes these people can be really saved. But they, because their attitude is, okay, Jesus, I'm saved. Thanks a lot, pal. Don't call me. I'll call you. And they go on their merry way. See? Now, that's, I don't understand that at all. But there are, even are Christians who are, who are maybe even venturing out and trying to live a Christian life, but they just forget to go to him for their help and realize he is the cure. Why do Christians go to Alcoholics Anonymous? Why do they do that? That's not the cure. Jesus is the cure. He's the one who can cure that. He's the one who can cure any kind of gambling problem, any kind of drug problem, any kind of lust problem, any kind of, any kind of problem you have with them. What we're talking about, a marriage problem, he's the cure. Right. He is the cure. Amen. All right? <clears throat> now, our Savior, not just our salvation from hell, he'll save you from a lot of other stuff too once you get, get saved from hell. Now, verses 25 through 29 once we get saved, we are, we are uh, not under the curse of the law. Our sins are paid for, and we are in Christ. And now we have access to all the promises. Uh, for instance, the, the, the inheritance, our inheritance. We have an access, access to all that, all because of our Savior. The law had nothing to do with it. Okay, so remember what the law was for, and thank God for the law. It showed you you needed Jesus. And then after you're saved, don't throw the law aside. Thank God for the law. Now, he, now he, this is a way of showing God I love you by obeying the law that's laid down in the Bible. Okay? Uh, there are, there's, a non, there's a denomination, and I don't know how big it is out here. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a church out here of this denomination, but it's called Evangelical Free. And they, they actually believe, at least some of the people I've talked to, then church, a church out there in the Midwest that I, I was, it was near where I, where I was living when I first got saved, uh, they, they taught that you're saved now, you can do anything you want. You're free to do anything you want. I don't see that in the Bible at all. In other words, they say, take the law and throw it out the window. And my question would be, so what you're saying is now since I'm saved, and since we, the, we're not under the law anymore, we're under grace, they'll say that a lot. Um, now you're saying that I can go out and commit adultery and it's okay because I'm not under the law. I can go out and lie because I'm not under the law. I can be an idolater because I'm not under the law. See, I can, have, I can, I can uh, not honor my mom and dad because I'm not under the law. Well, see, that's a bunch of baloney. See, you know, Jesus, if you notice, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus expanded on the law a lot when he was teaching. You see, so the law is definitely, it's, it was a big part of our life to get us to Christ, but now it's a big part of our life to help us to live for him and show him that we love him. And hopefully you're doing that. Okay. But then our faith is, is absolutely vital. Our, putting our faith in Christ is absolutely vital. And so hopefully you, you have done that. You put your faith in Christ. And then you want to take that same faith you have and you want to put that in, and apply it to your whole life, even after you're saved. So here's the invitation. And next week we're going to talk. There's a whole bunch of scripture in this, this chapter 3. We'll close chapter 3 next week by talking about the law and faith and the different verses and what, they, what you get by what, what the law does or what, what it shows you uh, and then what it does in your life and then also what faith does in your life. We're going to see a difference there in chapter 3. I've got it all outlined here. I'll show you that next week. But anyway, here's the invitation for tonight. I want to ask you, are you keeping God's law <clears throat> tonight to show him that you love him. Now, if you're not saved, of course, if you if you would like for me to sit down with you, I can show you that you have broken the law. I can use the law as a schoolmaster to instruct you that you need Jesus. Okay? But if you are saved, I'd like to ask you, are you keeping God's law to show him you love him? All right? <clears throat> totally apart from salvation. Totally apart. But because you are saved, because you are his child by faith in Jesus Christ. Now you want to keep the law to show him you love him. Are you doing that? Are you doing that in your life? Okay. Is there any area of your life you're being intentionally disobedient? You know you're not supposed to do it. You know you're not supposed to do that. But you're doing it anyway. Or you know you're supposed to do that. But you're not doing it. Okay. 
Are you, I want to ask you, how are you using the law of God? Are you using the law of God the way you're supposed to use it? John 14, 15, John 14, 21. Are you living a life of faith? The child of God should live. <clears throat> are you living a life of faith? Let me just show you a verse here. Uh, go to Romans 1, 17. And it's also in chapter in uh, Romans uh, Galatians chapter three verse eleven. But Romans one seventeen says this: the just shall live by faith. All right now, this per this verse tells me that the that this person's already just. It says it in Galatians three eleven too: the just shall live by faith. <clears throat> so this person's already just, already been justified, and he had been justified by faith. But he's also supposed to live by faith. Are you living by faith? I think we heard a message uh, back in October by Brother Fugit about how faith is, is just depending on God for everything. Are you depending on God? After all, <clears throat> he's giving you an inheritance. He's giving you eternal life. He's giving you an inheritance. Are you living by faith? Are you living by trusting him? How, ask yourself the question, how could I trust him for my salvation? But I can't, for something I cannot even see. I'm trusting him to go to a place I cannot see, but I'm not trusting him on this earth to live this life right now that I'm seeing in front of me. How, and I see it in the Bible. I see what, I, how, what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to trust him. And I see how powerful he is, how amazing he is, how, how he takes care of people, how, he, how people who live by faith were rewarded for that and blessed by it. And, and ne he never let anybody down. How can I not live by faith? How can you not live by faith? Total dependence on God. Are you doing that? If you aren't, why don't you decide? Why don't you make up your mind that tonight I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to trust God completely with my daily life. And then, are you claiming promises from him? Are you claiming promises? You claim the promise of whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. You claim that promise. You took God up on his word there. How about claiming the other promises that God offers you in the Bible? All kinds of things. You know, all kinds of promises. For instance, you may be sitting here tonight, and I'm just I'm gonna be done with this. You're you're worried about something. You're worried about things. You got some needs, and you're worried about it. You, you have some needs. I don't know how they're gonna be met. What about the promise of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you? What about the promise in Philippians 4:19, my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? What about that? Some of you walk around carrying this load of guilt. You've done something to somebody or done something to God and you got, or maybe you did something you really feel guilty of and yet you're not, what about claiming the promise of uh, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All kinds of promises. See, are you claiming the promises? I don't know about you, but when God promises something, I take it for me and I claim it. See, and God cannot lie. Amen, he cannot lie. Are you claiming the promises of God? It's that simple tonight. So, Ask yourself those questions tonight as we have the invitation. Are you keeping God's law to show him you love him? Are you living a life of faith? Are you claiming his promises? All right, let's pray.